Welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair. This show has been altered to conform with YouTube's rules on copyright. The music has been removed in some of the commercials. I hope you enjoy it, and God bless you and yours. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Welcome to Mo Banshee's Lair, rocking your world. That was Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong singing the way uh, you look tonight. Um, tonight, we have a very special guest. I am over the moon to have her. But first, let me welcome everybody listening. As everybody knows, Mobanchi's Lair is carried worldwide on the Internet. Then I put it on a podcast we're going out live now, and then it will be on YouTube tomorrow under Mo Banshee. And if you click Mo Banshee, you can find almost everything I do. I think I'm the only Mo Banshee in existence, uh, which is okay. You don't want more than me. You know, more than one of me is a dangerous thing. Uh, but our guest is is ready. And Catherine Lee Scott, welcome back to my lair. Oh, it's so good to be back with you. I just think you're terrific. Thank you, Mo. Thank and we're you. talking about something so very different than the last time. So that'll yes. be interesting. Yes, uh, you, you're, you're an author, you're uh, an actress, you're a publisher, you're, you're a, a world traveler. You are a very, very active lady. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I am very active, and, I, I, uh, and I'm very... Actually, I'm very blessed to be able to do all of the things that I really enjoy doing. And acting and, and writing are, are, are really my twin careers. Yeah. Uh, just just so we get everybody on uh, writing, uh, Catherine also has books out, The Jinx Fogarty Mysteries, Down and Out in Beverly Hills Jinxed, Fiction, uh, She's Got Dark Passages, Nonfiction, Dark Shadows Returns to Collinwoods, The Bunny Years, Dark Shadows Memories, Dark Shadows uh, Almanac, Dark Shadows Companion, Lobby Cards, the classic films, Lobby Cards, the classic comedies, a very uh, accomplished uh, writer, and I've got a number of your books. So this book is an autobiography of sorts, right? Well, a- absolutely. It's, uh, it's called Last Dance at the Savoy, Life, Love, and Caring for Someone with Supernuclear Palsy. And in my case, the someone is my husband, Jeff Miller, who was the founding editor of Los Angeles Magazine. He passed away five years ago this coming week I am uh, sorry. from progressive supernuclear palsy. And uh, the book is a, is a memoir. It's, it's really about caregiving. Uh, but it's also very much a love story. It's very much about life and love. It, and respect. Um, you know, when we say those little words, till death do us part, and sickness and health, today uh, a lot of that goes out the window when things go bad. You know what I'm saying? Now, Teddy and I are going on 40 years, and... Um, He's helped me through ovarian cancer. He's helped me through bladder cancer. Um, and, and then now it's his turn. He has Alzheimer's and cancer. And you know what? Nobody promises that your love story is not going to have some rough bumps through it, right? No. As a matter of fact, I, I write about that. The fact that, you know, once upon a time doesn't mean you're going to have happily ever after. Mm-hmm. And in my case... Uh, it was it was a really wonderful romance because we we met and uh, when he was starting the magazine in Los Angeles and I was doing Dark Shadows in New York and you know we were geographically uh, just unable to carry on a romance so uh, even though there was an attraction it was a good twenty years before we got together we got together in 1988. Um, for 20 years after we first met and it was very much a romantic story uh mm-hmm. our finding each other again and getting married and we were very much in love and you just you just can't ever imagine that things can turn so quickly in this case it was a, a series of 
uh, things that made us realize that, that there was something wrong, that Jeff had a neurological condition. So, that's, that, you know, and that, and that led to a few years of caregiving. I, I wish, I wish that it had been slower moving, that the progression hadn't been so quick, but he passed away four years after diagnosis. Yeah, see, it, this is progressive supernuclear palsy. Yes. Um, and Teddy has Alzheimer's, which it, when this happened to Teddy in 2002, um, he had been using the wrong words, okay? And so I was already like, what the heck is going on? You know, he's using the wrong words for certain things. But then I thought, you know, it's just age, you know, it's just this, it's just that. But then he had a massive bang, which I thought was a stroke. And um, I got him to the doctor right away. And the doctor saying, oh, it's abuse because he became violent and everything. And I said, he didn't know who I was. He didn't remember where we lived. He took me to the apartment we lived at that time 30 years before. I says, so this isn't just like, you know, something's wrong. And that's when they finally started checking him out and said, uh, he's got Alzheimer's. And we got him on the Menda right away. So that crash plateaued. And and it's been, like, what, like 12 years now, 14 right. years, whatever. You got slammed. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. This is what you got. And, and it was fast, like a train wreck. Well, it was. I mean, the, the, uh, now there are some interesting things we can talk about, Mo, because uh, progressive supranuclear palsy is one of five what they call prime-of-life diseases. They are neurological progressive diseases that have no treatment, no cure. One of them is cortical basal degeneration. Another is MSA. But another one is Lewy body with dementia, which is the one that Robin Williams was diagnosed with. Right. And then there's a PSP, which is what Jeff had and also claimed the lives of Dudley Moore and um, Richard Braintree, the billionaire financier. Right. And the fifth one that they very often include is ALS. Everybody knows right. it is. Lou Gehrig's, everybody knows what it is. It strikes about 20,000 Americans a year, which is the same number as PSP, and nobody knows about PSP. Yeah. So the reason why I really wanted to write this book also was to raise awareness for the disease, but also to let people know that the huge amount of research thanks to the billionaire Richard Raintree and among others that, have, that has gone into PSP research has also come up with some really interesting um, new developments in our understanding of these diseases, including Alzheimer's. I mm-hmm. think that I think researchers are looking at Alzheimer's differently as a result of, of some of the uh, research that's come out of um, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. Uh, Jeff wanted to be a guinea pig. Uh, he, he volunteered for a couple of clinical trials and an environmental study. He also donated his brain to cure PSP research because uh, a brain, it, it's the only way that one can yeah. ultimately diagnose uh, the presence of this disease. So, right. Um, so really, a lot of what they're finding out in the research into PSP is informing the research for Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. The, excuse me. The thing with um, ALS is you have people like Stephen Hawking, a world famous you know theorist who right, has and it. a famous baseball player. We need some. Yeah, very- Lou Gehrig's. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and nobody, nobody is stepping up and saying, "Sure, name it for me." You know, um, and know. and that that's what sucks about this. Uh, Alzheimer's is the same thing. Um, like I said, I and I got to tell you, it's probably the most ridiculous way. But remember Ben Casey? Yes. 
Brenda Vaccaro was, and I'm pretty sure it was Ben Casey, not Dr. Kildare, but she was a patient on the show. When are we going back to like 1960? And I remember she was young and she was cutting her hair off and behaving very erratically. And that's the first time I ever heard early onset Alzheimer's. I don't think anybody I knew even knew that word. And then all those years later, like, you know, 40 years later, I'm sitting there and my husband is using words like nipple instead of connect or anything that came to a point he would call a nipple or a, a do, doohickey or he was using these words. Um, so believe it or not, I started going, what the hell is going on here? You know, and yeah. and I, then I thought he was drinking on his own, which he did for a while. Uh, and and I you you missed early signs. What yes, were they? I think, that, I think that all of us do with uh, neurological conditions. You know, uh, uh, hindsight is, is, is so informative. Yeah, because it's great. You look back, and, and I, remember, I remember all sorts of little uh, odd behavioral things that I thought were sort of eccentric. Mm-hmm. And, and, it, and, it, and then, of course... Later on, when, when the symptoms became more pronounced, I realized that what I had considered little eccentricities, for example, he would tap a surface a couple of times before putting something down. It was because he, he was having trouble with, you know, uh, spatial uh, recognition. He, he, um, he would uh, adjust his eyeglasses when the eyeglasses weren't on his face. Uh, mm-hmm. He would. Uh, it was the way he walked. He would kind of list to the right. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the disease is that you fall backward, and Jeff must have had fifty falls in one year. Maybe some of them that I didn't even know about. Oh, sure. He's not going to but tell you all that. Backward. The other thing is uh, an inability to shift the eyes up and down. Mm-hmm. So it. I, I would say. Darling, please pick up your feet. You're looking at your look straight ahead. You won't trip. I was saying all kinds of things like that until, until he was diagnosed, and I understood what the symptoms were. And then I thought, oh my gosh, he was doing that three years ago. He was doing mm-hmm. that four years ago, and there were behavioral changes uh, similar to what you would have noticed with your husband, although. My my husband, uh, his symptoms didn't exhibit themselves in in you know in violence or or anything like that. No, but he did become annoyed. Dementia, but just really uh, uh, strange behavior that that wasn't in keeping with who my husband was. Right. And and you start putting those things together. But here's the other thing, Mo, that you and I have in common: when when you're very happily married. You you do what married people do. You pick up the slack. You yeah. You accommodate. You uh, somebody has uh, somebody drops something. You pick it up, um, and so that can go on for a long time before the symptoms become so pronounced that you think, oh no, there's something else going on here. Uh, I always tell people when they look at me and say, oh my God, you know, we don't even know people married as long as you. Uh, but that's because I'm dirt old to begin with, you know. Uh, but the, the thing is that at any moment in a marriage, one of the people is holding it all together. It's very rare for both people to be perfectly, everything's wonderful, and it's Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz and everybody's singing down the yellow brick world. There's just times when one or the other is holding it all together, and, and that's called marriage. You yeah, know? it is. As a matter of fact, in the book, I, I use an expression. I, I just say that, you know, it was, it, marriage is like two planets, you know, circling around each other in an odd solar system known as marriage. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and you, you uh, I, I, I mean, uh, I, it's probably harking to the Mars Venus thing, but, but truly, uh, marriage is, is such a sharing. And that sharing really does make you accommodate when you see that the other person needs help or, or is mm-hmm. vulnerable. So that is, you know, the caregiving, uh, the caregiving is almost always there in any kind of marriage. It's, yeah. it's there from the beginning. 
but the other thing that one has to deal with, and I know you're dealing with it, is the role reversal, which is very difficult to adjust to. In other words, the you know the uh, the the man who would hold your arm uh, becomes the man that you're holding his arm. Actually, and, I'm holding him up. Yep, that's right. And it, it there is a role reversal there that is very difficult. Uh, for example, you know when my husband uh, could no longer drive and thank heaven, he just handed me the keys. And yeah, I, I had to fight over that. Well, you were we, lucky. We had a, I, I, I go into it in the book. Yes, you too. It was a little bit more complicated than mm-hmm. that because my, my husband was involved in what was called a, uh, a felony hit and run, which was right. reduced to a misdemeanor. But it was, um, uh, it was an unfortunate incident that, uh, in which, uh, Somebody actually, a jogger ran into his car, put it that way, Mm -hmm. uh, at a stop sign. And because he was so befuddled and because he he seemed um, uh, befuddled, I guess is the best word. I think that's probably Um, the best word. He was confused. He was confused. And uh, and because uh, he had trouble with his vision, Mm -hmm. and I had not picked up on any of that, uh, you know, it... It it evolved into a serious problem, and um, it, and it evolved over time. It wasn't like just yesterday and then today. Bang! No. And he gave me the car keys, which. But then, you know, he also wanted to get together with his his chums for lunch, and he didn't want them to know that he couldn't drive. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I mean, men have their own things that for them, define them. Yeah, and the, the masculine role. Thing. They and are the provider. They are the, yeah. they are the protector. They are, they are the strength. And I always say, when I'm helping families and stuff, and I will always turn around and say, you will be shocked to find out who the weakest link is, very often families. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and when they are, they're used to being, your husband's a businessman, he's in the publishing game, he's a man who's accustomed to uh, having authority. I'm not saying he's Donald Trump an asshole, I'm saying he's a guy who's used to saying, okay, let's do this ABC, and suddenly now he's got to give his car keys over. That's, That's like, right. cut, cut so, my legs off, so you know? I would, I would drop him off and say hello to every, you know, who he was having lunch with, and we'd make up an excuse, right? And then uh, at a at a set time, I'd come back and pick him up, and and we we did we did things like that again because he was uncomfortable um, until he became so symptomatic that then uh, everybody you know, knew. Then we then we we started telling people that mm-hmm. he had a a problem, yeah. but initially. Um, there was that accommodation. Mm-hmm. And, and then when you become a caregiver, and as the disease progresses, you have to help with everything, um, you know, the uh, feeding and bathing and everything, uh, the, the role reversal is complete. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll tell you how Teddy lost his keys. Uh, it, it was early, early on, and I kept saying he was pulling into the shopping center, and I says. If you don't stop, you're going to hit that tree. If you don't stop, you're going to hit that tree. Bang. He looked at me, says, well, I hit the tree. And I said, yeah, you did. (laughs) So then uh, a couple of days later, we were driving down the highway, and he just turned around and started cleaning the car. And we're going down Route 9 in New Jersey. And I'm like, pull over the car. That's it. Give me the effing (laughs) key. <laughs> because he's on the oh, floor, yeah. he's on yeah. the floor that, picking up that, tissues, and know, he's... we're talking about uh, two very different diseases. Yeah, have, that, that have some of the same similarities. Yeah, and, uh, even though dementia was not a part of Jeff's disease, and that's in sad. The end, in the end, it's always going to be present. Yeah, because it, he, you see, Teddy doesn't remember day to day. Um, he doesn't remember having his cancer surgery. Do you yeah. s- Jeff lived through it. He, 
he was there. He was cognizant of it. And his body, I've, I've been watching so many people who talk about this that have it. And they said, I'm trapped in my body. The few people that could yeah. still talk. And you could see the agony in their face because yeah. it's your body is betraying you, but your mind is still reading everything. I know. And, you know, they, the, the, you know David Niven had ALS. Right. And so did Jacob Javits. And we're talking about people that were extravagantly social. And in David Niven's case, you know, a great raconteur. And for him to lose his ability to speak and to communicate and, mm-hmm. and with that very sharp mind be trapped in his body, it's just horrible. And yeah. Jeff was making stock trades until two weeks before he passed away. But he couldn't, he couldn't speak. Uh, he, uh, he had no control over his limbs. And you are trapped, fully cognizant in your body. Mm-hmm. The dementia that that does take place uh, is is really it's because of the medications and and, and so on. Yeah, the ravages as 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 the body starts to shut down, which you put so poignantly because I went through this discussion with the doctors. When is it time to just make them comfortable? And and you and I are sitting there thinking, no, you put a friggin' uh, feeding tube in, you do this, you do this, you do this, and they're saying it's not going to help. And you're yeah. kind of like, ugh, no. you know? No, no, Ellen, that, there, there are two things that I really want to talk to you about, Mo, because yep. now I've been in a lot of support groups, and, and I've been leading support groups because I am a, a volunteer spokesperson for the Cure PSP Foundation. And I did a, uh, a, um, I led a, uh, a support group in San Francisco a couple weeks ago and another one here in New York, um, uh, uh, after that. And the, and one of the things that always comes up is, uh, really the end of life. And, and nobody really understands hospice. No. Um, in my, in our case, uh, and I talk about it in Last Dance at the Savoy, we brought in hospice, uh, home hospice, because it provides you with help with the bathing care uh, and a nurse uh, that will come in uh, fairly frequently, a, a, a doctor on call. Um, but you've got home help that's really trained and it's palliative care because, in my husband's case, there was going to be no treatment, no cure. Mm-hmm. And it made him comfortable. So we're not talking about end of life. We are talking about quality of life. Right, and exactly. And it is available. It is so much cheaper uh, in terms of insurance, in terms of you know what our government spends on health care. It is so much better when it can happen within the home. And... and- and- they're comfortable. They're they're not taken out of their element. No, and and they're getting the very best of care. And in my case, uh, w- once hospice came in, um, I turned our bedroom into. Uh, and fortunately, it's a, it was it's a fairly large bedroom, but I I turned it into what amounted to a cocktail lounge. Uh, there you I go. Said, but that that means that I just put up a, a little round table with a cloth and a candle and a couple of chairs. And from 5 to 7 every day, everybody that knew Jeff, colleagues and friends, uh, knew that they could stop in and have a, a Sam Adams or a glass of wine, uh, you know, some cake, some mm-hmm. tea. And, and Jeff looked forward to it, even though he couldn't speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, it meant that he was social, that, that, uh, that friends were able to come by and see him. I, I got rid of all of the medications. You, the room did not look like an invalid was there. Well, you did and that for your mother, too, because just before this, you had your mother had been diagnosed with cancer, and you right. said her, her room kind of looked like a really high-end hotel room. I know. I, I, again, you know, you can do this at home. I mean, and, and almost anybody in any circumstance can can somehow create an atmosphere that is cheerful, that's got a, a, a good feeling to it, 
so it doesn't feel like uh, an invalid is there, so that Mm-hmm. So that a person doesn't feel isolated, and I don't mean just the person with the disease. I'm also talking about the caretaker, caregiver, right. because again and again, what comes up in these support groups are people saying what an isolating disease this is. Right. So one of the things that I I worked hardest at was to not make us isolated, to open Jeff up to all of the people who had known him, to all of our friends. Um, and it, it made a world of difference. So one of the things I talk about is what hospice truly is, mm-hmm. so that it's not the scary thing where, you know, you bring in hospice and die a day later. Right. No, that's not what it is. And and also uh, just the idea of saying, you know, life isn't over until it's over. Right. Uh, it's not over until the fat lady sings. And so. I ain't warmed up, right? Yeah, so just... <laughs> Take every single moment, every precious moment, and make the most of it. Um, okay. Uh, I've got your the little thing uh, that I was sent, and I'm trying to keep on it, and I know I bounce around a lot, but that's me. Uh, it was four years from the time he was diagnosed to, to the time he passed away, pretty much, about yes. a four-year window. Yeah. Um, and, and so... Out of this wreckage, uh, I, for Teddy, I have a nickname. I call him Crash. See, we didn't know about the cancer. Up until uh, even Christmas 2013, he was carrying 20, 30-pound bags of cat litter up three flights of stairs. And on New Year's Eve, I don't know what it is about New Year's Eve, but you mentioned New Year's Eve, a fall, a bad fall. Uh, in your book, uh, Teddy fell New Year's Eve 2013-14. That was the first time we knew anything physical was going on with him. And then he fell a week later, and I had his rear up there because Teddy does not fall. I fall all the time. I have MS lupus. Falling is my Olympic event. I am, a, I am a, you know, an Olympic uh, hero. I fall. I, I can be standing in front of you and just fall. I drop things. That's my other thing. Uh, but Teddy never fell. Uh, and so you, you start seeing this advanced falling and four years later you lose him and then you become a national volunteer spokesperson for Cure PSP. It's an yes. international organization. Is this your way of uh, working through it? Well, uh, yes, but but it it also it has to do with paying it forward. When I went to that first support group meeting, I did not handle it very well, and it was there were two women there. Both of them had one had lost a father, one had lost a husband, and those two women reached out to me, and. They were volunteers uh, with the support group, and they made all the difference in the world in my life. And when Jeff passed away, uh, it, I, I didn't walk away from uh, everything that had been part of the caregiving years. I, I really wanted to participate because there were people who had done it for me. I wanted to do it for others. Right. And most of the people who you find um, helping out at these support groups are people who have been caregivers. Right. Uh, it's, it's almost a, a tradition. Uh, you become so involved and you just want to do more. And Jeff wanted to be a part of the cure. I want to be a part of the cure. Mm-hmm. So as far as you know, a portion of the proceeds from the sale of Last Dance at the Savoy benefits Cure PSP and their research. Mm-hmm. And whatever I can do as far as, uh, you know, leading these support groups, I would be happy to do so. One of the things that I think really is making the book a success is the fact that I included a resource guide because when Jeff was diagnosed, I was trolling the Internet trying to find information, trying to figure out, you know, what we needed to right. protect him, make him safe, protect me. Mm-hmm. And so the resource guide at the end, which is a lengthy one, goes into terrific detail about uh, certain things. For example, I'll just pick one. Um, 
there's a, a product that, uh, that thickens liquids so that it keeps you from choking. Right. Um, and I put that in there and discuss it, the, um, the sorts of um, uh, people that you need to bring into your life, a speech therapist, occupational therapist, uh, uh, all of these things which can be prescribed by your doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are one of the things that they have discovered about PSP and all of these diseases is that exercise is absolutely central uh, to quality yes. of life and to retarding the progression of the disease. Keeping this their is, minds working, keeping right. their bodies working. Absolutely. And again, I talk about that in the book and I really point it up in the, in the resource guide because I, I give, uh, you know, 800 numbers and, and websites so that people can find these people, that, uh, these professionals that can help them with handicap equipment and, and, mm-hmm. uh, and all, of the other, all of the other things that you really Shortcuts, just little shortcuts. Teddy has an ostomy now um, because he had colon cancer, stage four, and they told me he, he wasn't even going to live through surgery. It's two years later. He's still alive. Uh, but, you know... Everything is, just ask your Wonko nurse. I had one lesson from a Wonko nurse, and they sent him home because he survived the surgery. Little, little shortcuts, like you're cleaning this mess up, what do you use? You know those Chinese plastic containers that you get, like Chinese soup in? Well, you know what fits in them perfectly is dog poop bags, those cleanup bags for dogs. Mm -hmm. And you know what fits in there perfectly? Everything you use to clean up his ostomy. Um... If I didn't belong to a support group, I wouldn't have even known that because they were telling me, just put a bag on his lap and then throw everything in the bag. And, and, you know, the poor guy is laying there with a pound of shit sitting on, excuse me, on his his lap in in a garbage bag, you know, where this is so much easier and efficient and gives them some dignity while you're trying to take care of them, you know. Support groups are amazing for ideas, yeah, they are, and uh, uh, and I know exactly what you're talking about because there are so many things that only caregivers are willing to talk about yep. <laughs> among themselves because it is it's 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 not a nice job. It's not. Uh, it's it's just not, and uh, it's uh, it's it's not a pretty business. It's a privilege to be able to care for it is. that you love. But but you also have to be mindful that uh, it's a terrible job. It's and a burnout job. You right. have to have and a break. You don't want to burn out, so you no. want to make everything as easy as possible, and you want to protect yourself so that you are safe. I learned how to use a gate belt, which is that you know that webbed thick belt yeah. with a buckle that you uh, put around uh, the patient's waist, and it mm-hmm. gives you a better grip on them. I learned how to use that. There were so many things. Another thing I learned is that Jeff, when when I tried to walk him, would sometimes freeze, and I would try everything to get him to move until I learned that singing helps. So there we were. And, And by the way, something I've got to say to you is that my book is very funny. I it is. It's very funny. And and so I, uh, I I I'm there's a lot of humor in the book. Because yes, it's wry humor. The, the middle of the night, I was trying to walk Jeff to the bathroom, and he froze in the middle of the bedroom floor. We're both of us half dressed. I thought, oh my God, he's going to sink to the floor. I can't call the paramedics or the, or the fire department or the neighbors. Ah, oh. and we started singing. Mm-hmm. We were singing some enchanted evening and. Something about music releases mm-hmm. whatever that mechanism is in the brain that releases the muscle uh, or the, whatever. I, I, I have no medical background. All I know is that this works. And we, it worked. Yeah. So we were singing, uh, tw- you know, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, uh, a bicycle built for two. Mm-hmm. Now they, of course, discovered that, that music is therapeutic. Yeah. So anyway, but I mean, these are the things that you talk about in these support groups. These are the things that are in the book. Yes, they are. Um, yeah, your book is, it's dry and wry humor. And that's what I call it. Um, Teddy, Teddy does get uh, very vocal. And um, 
my name is the bitch because <laughs> you're nothing but a bitch. And I says, I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. <laughs> and and it doesn't. He doesn't quite understand it, but it breaks the 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 the, the mental strain. Yeah. Right. It, it breaks the road, and then he stops, and then we can pick up and go where we need to be. And I'll I'll just sit there and start laughing. And and I know you you have a busy schedule, but here's a perfect story. Of a breaking a, 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 a moment, I met. I made dinner for him, and um, I gave him wild rice. And he's like a five year old. He's taking the fork and he's pushing it, and he's pushing it around the dish. And he says, "What is this?" And I says, "It's rice." And he's pushing it around. He says, "Did you burn it? Because it's black, right?" And I says, "No, it's wild rice." Uh, where do you get it? Well, now I'm getting a little mischievous, you know, and that's where you have to bring in some kind of levity or it would be tedious. And I said, well, they grow it on farms, but sometimes I walk along the road and I pick it up and I cook it for you. (laughs) And he looked at it and just pushed it completely over to the side. Now, out of there, I have no idea how we went to, you know, those magazines that I cut up, he's got back into this thing from when he was a child. He used to cut things up for his mother. She would give him things to cut up to keep him busy. And he's back into that. And I says, yeah, they're magazines from... And he says, Daniel. And I says, her name is Danielle. She's your daughter-in-law. And he says, they belong to her grandmother, didn't they? I says, yeah. He says, I think she's a lesbian. (laughs) Well, I almost choked on my dinner. And I said, why? He says, every other picture in it is a half-naked woman or a woman in her underpants. And I was dying because it's the way the mind just bounces back and forth and stuff. So when you have somebody stuck, one of the best things you can do is throw a curveball at them. Yeah. And and snap them loose, you know. And I'm very good at that. That's why he calls me a bitch. (laughs) Well, I have to say... That humor really did get us through. And I've got something uh, else that I wanted to mention that you don't know about yet, and that is that I have recorded the book. Oh, wow. uh, So that there will be, uh, uh, right now, Last Dance at the Savoy is available on Amazon in the print edition, and the Kindle edition will be available April 16th, which is the fifth anniversary of my husband's passing. Mm-hmm. And very soon, there will also be an MP3 download. So there'll be an audio book. Uh, because it occurred to me, when I was a caregiver, I had no time to go to a no. bookstore. I was on Amazon. I was finding everything online. So that's why I've made it available uh, in these ways. Um, to buy the Kindle version or to buy the print edition off uh, Amazon, Makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, and 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 I want to talk about that because what I do is Teddy doesn't go into a deep sleep till maybe four or five in the morning, even though he's on medication. And I'll have my MP3 player, and I'll be listening to music all night, waiting for him to finally go because I can't go to sleep unless he goes to sleep. You know. Yeah. yeah. And and so downtime for a caregiver is it's essential. But it's not always there. And so, uh, you know, people, if you've got, and this book is perfect for any, anybody who's a caregiver, not just progressive super nuclear palsy. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's very perfect for, every, for anybody. Yeah. yeah, because it's giving you ideas to cope because caregivers burn out so fast that sometimes they drop dead before the patient does. Yeah, this is true. Uh, and and I, uh, there, was a, there was a time when I was really not feeling well, and I knew I had to take better care of myself. I, I address all of that in the book. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for anybody who thinks, oh, it's going to be a sad book, it's and the not. guy dies at the end, the truth is the book is very inspirational. It's it funny. It is. And it's a it's a light read. I've, I've all of the reviews that I've had so far point up the fact 
of the humor in the book. Yeah, yeah. Even he laughed, like when he fall over and then ro- rolled out of the car. And oh, he's <laughs> he's laughing, oh. and, and you know we we have it here. You know, you know, shit happens. What are you going to do? Stand there and cry? Like I said, life handed you a, a whole big tree of lemons. Make lemonade out of it. Uh, it's not you, it's not going to go away. So deal with it and and get on. You and, know what Jeff always used to say? Uh, you know that's life. Nobody gets out alive. <laughs> right, right. Um, the uh, the book is on Amazon, and Catherine, what is your site so everybody can oh, go yes, to your site? Please go on my site. It is www.catherineleescott.com. K A T H R Y N L E I G H S C O T T dot com, and the uh, the um, Oh, if you go on Amazon, you'll find it, the print yeah. book, the, the Kindle version. And something I'm terribly proud of is that I wrote a piece for Maria Shriver. It um, has a wonderful uh, caregiving site, right. uh, mariashriver.com. And that's going to be published on the 16th of April. And it's also going to be featured in her newsletter. And I'm, I'm very excited about that. So t- please, I, I hope everybody that that, you know, gets the book, reads it, and enjoys it, will also review it. Okay, so um, a, a portion of your proceeds are going towards uh, finding more information, doing more research. Yes, um, it, it benefits Cure PSP, the foundation for which I'm a, a, a volunteer spokesperson. Yeah, uh, What what's up next for you? Because, I mean, you're traveling all over the world. Oh, well, but... I'm leaving in the morning for Los Angeles. I've got two book signings scheduled in Los Angeles. And then uh, I'm also going to be recording another Dark Shadows original drama on CD, and uh, and then on June 27th, um, we're going to be having our, our Dark Shadows Festival celebrating the 50th anniversary, and wow. that'll be in Terrytown, New York. And in between, I've got, oh, I've got another novel that I'm just finishing up, so there's a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, the, the one that I really like, that one, uh, and and I'm trying to, to remember it, you know, where she's... The, the, oh, Down the, and Out in Beverly Hills. No, no, the vampire one. Oh, Dark Passages. Yeah, uh, it's oh, the I second one. Book. Is the second one out yet? It is. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are you going to yeah. be anywhere around Philadelphia, New Jersey, you know, area t- to sign books? Oh, yeah. You know what? Not yet, but I promise you I will. Mo, I would love that. Yeah, um, I'm going to try to get up to Terrytown there uh, to, to the Dark Shadows uh, thing. Um, it, it, again, uh, my health isn't so great, so they don't let me out alone. Uh, <laughs> But uh, then I have to have Teddy, a babysitter for Teddy. And and I kind of giggled because you said, you know, you got to get a babysitter just to go to the store. And these are our husbands and our wives yeah. and, and, and our parents. And it kind of sounds like we're being flippant when we say, well, I'd love to go, but I need a babysitter for Teddy. But it, that's exactly what you need. I you know, need a caretaker. And you can't just pick up. It changes every dynamic of the relationship. You, I, know. I know. And 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 you can't just pick up and fly like you did. And and uh, it, it's, it's just uh, how do you keep their self-image? And how do you keep their pride and their self-esteem up? while yours is getting torn down because you get tired. And something you related in there, too, about losing weight. He was losing weight. And you had no clue you were losing weight. And last night, my daughter was uh, having words with a family member here and says, uh, do you not see her wasting away here? Because I've lost at least 50 pounds in the last year. Oh, boy. Because That's I'm a lot. I'm taking care of him. And, and when he got his wheelchair, they said, this is pretty heavy. Can you lift it? I said, I carried him in here. And he's 165 pounds. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, I carried him in here, so I better be able to pick this goddamn oh wheelchair gosh. up. Oh, but no. <laughs> I Listen, says, 
Take care of yourself. And yes. Listen, I have to say, it's just always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me on your Thank show. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody, uh, visit her site, KatherineLeeScott.com, and also uh, Amazon. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to start playing some music. And it's some of Catherine and Jeff's favorite music. He was a jazz lover. Um, so I picked out all the music that's mentioned in the book that he loved And uh, we'll be right back. I'm going to go to a commercial and a song. And, uh, Catherine, all you have to do is hang up. Thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Take care. (laughs) Night-night. Dream. Stream. Radio. Um, I'm over the moon. My guest tonight is Bob Greenberg. This is a free report. (laughs) Yes. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, himself, as we say in the Irish, Eddie Benitez, uh, welcome to the lair. Thank you. Yeah. How are you, you know, doing? Hello. Hello, Sarah Carlock? Yes, hi. Is How this? are you, Mo? I'm fine. Welcome to the lair. Terry Soto, uh, Captain Celluloid from the uh, movie TV conventions that he holds in New York. Welcome to my lair. Hello, Mo. Thank you for having me back. And our guest, Arch Hall Jr., uh, aviator, musician, author, uh, and uh, everything else. I, I think you walk on water. Welcome to my <laughs> welcome to my lair. Well, thank you, Mo. Thank you. Good to be on with you tonight. Uh, Michael Patrick Boatman, welcome to Mo Banshee's lair. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> This is Mo inviting you to listen to my show, Mo Banshee's Lair. We feature a variety of topics, A to Z, and guests, all kinds of guests. Mo Banshee's Lair, Tuesday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern on DreamStreamRadio.com. And I'll see you, my pretties. <laughs> Where over the rainbow Thank you for visiting me at my lair, and God bless you and yours.